So this awesome. is the um, the round table on reflections on the CPEMC slash CMC. And we have four different panelists who maybe we could start seeing now. Norma and Joyce, are you guys there? And um, mm -hmm. they all have different compositional perspectives and experiences and their time at the CMC was actually spanning over 50 years. So they were all at, there at different times, I believe. So I think we'll get different reflections from different times. I'm gonna do some brief introductions and then we'll go to two rounds of questions. One is more about the composer's own work and then one is more about their reflections on the studios. So Norma Beecroft is an award-winning composer renowned for her use of electronic sound and commissioned by many of Canada's leading artists, ensembles, and organizations. She's also had a career in broadcasting and television, and as a radio producer, as a commentator, and a documentarist. Many of her compositions combine electronic sounds with live instruments. She interviewed in the 70s many of the world's leading composers using technology, resulting in her book, Conversations with Post-World War II Pioneers of Electronic Music. She received an honorary doctorate from York University in Toronto in 96. Judy Klein is an American composer and educator with degrees from UC Berkeley, the Conservatory of Music in Basel, Switzerland, and New York University. She studied computer music with Charles Dodge at Brooklyn College Center for Computer Music, and she taught computer music composition at NYU in the 1980s, founding a computer music studio there. She was consultant for electroacoustic music preservation at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts in the 90s through 2006. She's been artist in residence or guest composer at many institutes and is contributing editor for Open Space and Perspectives, <coughs> excuse me, Perspectives of New Music. Joyce Sullivan, Sullivan Mormon grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. She attended segregated public elementary and high schools. She earned her bachelor's degree from Vassar College, the MAT from Rutgers, the MFA from Sarah Lawrence College, and the doctorate in education from Columbia University. She's received awards and recognition for her compositions, including June Jordan Award in 2003, for excellence in the field of arts and performance and the perpetuation of African-American culture. She won the Vienna Modern Masters 1998 Millennium Commission competition. She was professor at Manhattan Community College. Her compositions have been performed by Brooklyn Philharmonic Chamber Ensemble, Rose City Brass Quintet, and many others. And our final panelist is Lori Spiegel. She's an American composer known primarily for her electronic music compositions and algorithmic composition software. In the 1970s and 80s, she worked at Bell Laboratories in both music and computer graphics. Her 1980s program, Music Mouse, for Max Amigas and Ataris introduced the idea of intelligent instruments to the wider world via personal computers. It became widely used and she has published it for many years. Her music was chosen for the golden record placed aboard the Voyager spacecraft in 1977 and she also composed music which was included in the film Hunger Games. She was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 2018. Okay, so those are our panelists, and there'll be time at the end for audience questions, again, as in the other panels. Um, so if you want to hit the Q&A button at the end, um, or anytime, I guess they can be collected, and we can try to answer, uh, the panelists will try to answer those near the end. Okay, so let's go to our first round, and um, this is about um, each composer talking about their own work. And um, shall we start with you, Norma? Are you there? I'm not hearing you. I'm here. <laughs> but uh, somehow or other, there's no picture anyway. Ah, uh, can you click the video button? Well, I don't quite know what's happening. But anyway, um, okay. I, I can certainly talk to you. Uh, I have to go back in time to... 1952, when I started studying composition uh, in Toronto with um, John Weinswag, who was a very well-known composer. Uh, 
and teacher at the Faculty of Music, University of Toronto. And he actually, uh, um, I was working during the day at CBC uh, television. And uh, so therefore my studies had to be ha happen in the evening. And I went up, up to his home and, uh, and um, became very much a part of the wine swag household. And that was kind of an interesting thing because I got involved with the wine swag uh, philosophy of living and, and composing. And uh, he was a very important person. He was a, um, the main founder of the Canadian League of Composers. And the, um, they set up a committee called the Canadian Music Associates, which was a concert committee and put on Canadian music. And I became the chairman of that at a very early age. And uh, in my composition studies and the Canadian Music Associates, we had invited Vladimir Usachevsky to come to Toronto to talk about his tape music way back in 1957. And uh, I, I don't know, that was, the, that was a very captivating uh, moment for me in terms of uh, my, uh, my first exposure to the idea of extending sound by a technology. And uh, Usachevsky had been known to the people at the Faculty of Music at the U of T um, because they were consultants for the um, University of Toronto studio, which was set up in the early 1960s. In any case, I went to Europe and um, 59 to continue my studies over there. And um, well, let me say, first of all, I heard Usachevsky talk about his sonic contours. That was the piece I think with amplified piano or, or transformed piano sounds, et cetera. And I was completely captivated by that. And then I went to Europe and I heard in, in Darmstadt in 1960 or 1961, I'm not sure which year now, was uh, Stockhausen's Contact, which was a very famous piece at the time. And he, he uh, uh, well, that just sort of blew my mind. And I, I knew that was where my direction was going to go. And I returned back in 1962 from Europe after three years of study, um, where I graduated from the Academy of St. Cecilia in 1961. And I had been in Darmstadt for those two summers uh, and uh, been exposed to people like Bruno Moderna and uh, Stockhausen and Boulez and all of those famous names of that period of time. In any case, um, the um, Stockhausen and Usachevsky pieces were the ones that got me involved with the electronic music scenario. And so um, having heard that, an amazing piece. The University of Toronto studio was up and running when I came back to Toronto, but it was mainly for use of students. And I was a working girl at, at CBC in those days. And um, so I was not particularly what you would call your average student. I had to work um, in the evening and at my composition and studies. And uh, anyway, um, the idea of working at the University of Toronto studio was the teacher there was Myron Schaefer. And he, his idea of uh, teaching electronic music was that you collected sounds on, uh, for everybody to use. And I was not interested in that at all. <laughs> I was interested in doing my own thing. And uh, so uh, I took a leave of absence from the CBC in 1964 and uh, applied to Columbia Princeton to work at the electronic music studio there. And Mario Davidovsky was there employed and he sort of worked in the, uh, I would call it the equivalent of the tone meister, uh, the European idea of somebody helping, helping you out in, in the, with the technology. Um, anyway, I worked there for the summer um, of 1964 and created a, a gigantic piece. And I should tell you a little bit about that gigantic piece. It initially was a commission from Walter Suskin for the Toronto Symphony. And they, it was supposed to be for tape and, and orchestra, 
But Walter Siskin just about flipped his lid when he realized what it was going to involve in terms of, <laughs> of the technology and the rehearsal for the orchestra. So in any case, um, I, I, I pursued that, that particular piece, but it, it expanded with uh, some poetry, which my sister had written. And uh, it was for uh, narrator, um, choir, solo soprano, orchestra, and three channel tape, which was kind of unusual in those days. And uh, the name of the piece was called From Dreams of Brass. And that was my first piece that I ever did with tape. And of course I was everything but the kitchen sink. And, I, and I, it was a very ambitious piece to try and tackle. But anyway, it was recorded uh, by the CBC later on. And uh, it has never been performed live since. But anyway, that was my inaugural uh, introduction to um, working with tape. Then after that, I just simply went on and worked with instruments and tape. My whole concept was essentially um, uh, the idea that I had was the, I wanted the tape to be an extension of instrumental sound. That was my main concern. And uh, I, that was, uh, uh, that was the thing that I pursued actually was with, I wrote quite a number of pieces in the sixties and the seventies and the eighties or tape and instruments, including a ballet and, uh, you know, some really large scale works. So anyway, that's sort of my, my history, but it was the Columbia Princeton studio that got me going. Great, thank you. Um, good, so let's move to another panelist to address the initial question. And um, who would like to go next? Perhaps Judy? I don't remember raising my hand, but I'll <laughs> um, first, of, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody. Um, and um, thanks to the producers for inviting me to join the symposium. And Mara, thank you for moderating the roundtable. Um, Norma, it's, it, it's uh, nice to meet you. And Joyce, nice to meet you. Lori, it's great to see you again. Uh, okay, I'm going to come a little closer. Am I at a good distance in terms of sound? I'm okay. All right. So um, when when I returned from Europe, I encountered the music of uh, the American post-war composers like John Cage, Morton Feldman, and the American avant-garde. Alan Lucier and, and others, and perhaps more importantly and most importantly, the music of women, um, many working in electronic uh, music, and they became extremely influential to me. Um, Ruth Anderson, Ania Lockwood, Marianne Amache, Pauline Oliveros. In my mind, it was these women women who gave me permission to be myself in my musical endeavors. I really had come from Europe, European studies of music and what was considered to be acceptable um, contemporary music. So um, I was composing, um, I, ha I had been introduced already to electronic music uh, while I was in Basel. Uh, Thomas Kessler introduced me. And um, at New York University, I was, I was using a Buchla modular synthesizer. Uh, the studio was dismantled in favor of some computer music instruments that were not appropriate for me. Earlier today, Alice Shields said something about touching, physically touching music. And um, while I... Um, with analog sound, while I really could physically touch, it would seem that I could physically touch music because the sound was on tape. I couldn't get inside of it. And that's where I wanted to be. So in 85, 1985, in a summer workshop at Brooklyn College, the Center for Computer Music, Charles Dodge introduced me to 
computer music composition on a mini mainframe computer. And there I found what I was looking for and what I needed kind of unknowingly. It was my entry into what I would call the interior of sound, the precise details of every component, uh, the harmonic spectrum, the details of amplitudes, the tiny microscopic variances that render sound alive, et cetera. And this is all enabled by um, computer analysis of sound and by the ability to apply the study of psychoacoustics into sound making. So there I found my home. Um, I was happy as a lark. And I think on the second day that I was in that workshop, I told Charles that he would never get me out of the studio. And he didn't until I lugged that computer over to NYU. Um, I was uh, working in Music 11, a precursor to C-Sound. And to this day, I still work in C-Sound. And what the music N language did for me was uh, allow me to delve into the masterful work of John Chowning, Jean-Claude Risset, Paul Lansky, Charles Dodge, among others, and of course the work of Max Matthews. Um, I'm the least prolific composer I know. For the most part, my music represents years of research and involvement in non-music issues a text I want to share, to be heard, the beauty and the plight of animals, which I want to share, my objection to speciesism, the horror I feel about the treatment of animals in the wild and, of course, in factory farming, the relationship between human enslavement and the designation of animals in, uh, as property, the genocide, human genocide, and the slaughter of animals in factory farming in particular, and as well my appreciation for the work of everyone in the field of animal rights, working on behalf of those sentient beings whose voices still go unheard. Lastly, about my music, I do feel a tremendous responsibility in working with electronic sound. I so love musical instruments, acoustical, traditional, Music, music instruments from all over the world. And I feel that any music coming from um, electronics, or at this point from the computer, has to be inherent to the computer. Um, so I'm saddened by the imitation of acoustic instruments for practical and commercial purposes. And I think that's all I will say. I'm going to mute. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, yes. And now can we hear from uh, Joyce? Okay. Um, and I'm not sure how I should proceed, but let me just thank Ellie, first of all, for acknowledging the contributions of Native Americans and the slaves, since I am a descendant of slaves. My parents were both from Southeast Georgia and their ancestors uh, lived and worked on plantations in, in Georgia. Um, I, um, I, I guess I sort of haphazard, I've, I've sort of pursued my career rather haphazardly, I guess I should say. I actually went to college as a chemistry major and decided I enjoyed practicing the piano more than working in the chemistry lab and decided then to go on and uh, pursue a graduate degree uh, with emphasis on piano. And while I was at Rutgers University uh, pursuing a, a master's degree, uh, a MAT degree with emphasis on piano, I studied with Robert Mays and then decided, well, I think I enjoy composing more than, than uh, performing, uh, but I didn't go immediately to, to study for composition. I worked for a couple of years in the Southeast. I really was pursuing, I thought, a teaching career. Um, but after a couple of years in the Southeast, I decided to apply 
for a graduate program at Sarah Lawrence in music composition, the MFA degree in music composition. And I was accepted as a student by Maya Kufferman. And Maya Kufferman uh, taught me 12 tone composition and, and introduced me to his works which combined uh, 12 tone composition with jazz. He called it 12 tone jazz, but he never really instructed me to write 12 tone jazz. But, but uh, I, I guess after that introduction, um, I, I sort of explored that, uh, that route, I suppose. Um, and um, the, also at Sarah Lawrence, I decided to take an electronic music class and I took a class with Joel Spiegelman. Then after I left Sarah Lawrence, I worked for a couple of years. I liked going to school, I decided more than working. And so I decided to apply for the EDD program at Columbia University and I was accepted in that program. Uh, my first semester there, I said, well, you know, that electronic music class at Sarah Lawrence was interesting. Why don't I see if I can get into an electronic music class here? So um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how I proceeded, but at any rate, I, I, had an, I got an appointment with Yusuchevsky. I was told to bring my thesis from Sarah Lawrence. I had written a 12 minute orchestral composition at Sarah Lawrence. So I took that and showed it to Yusuchevsky and he accepted me into his electronic music class. Now, I won't go into more detail about uh, the Electronic Music Center right now. I'll come back to that later, but let me just move on with my career. I never saw electronic music actually as, as my emphasis. Um, up to this point, I had written mainly what you would call chamber music and, and some art songs. So um, after I graduated from Columbia with the EDD degree, I um, sought teaching jobs <laughs> and, and, and I married also while I was at Columbia, I married a uh, Juilliard trained freelance percussionist. Also at Columbia, I met uh, Tanya Lee, not at Columbia, but while I was at Columbia, I guess I should say, I met uh, Tanya Leon. I was actually living at International Student House. And International Student House is right across the street from Manhattan School of Music. So I, I met some uh, students at Manhattan School of Music at uh, International Student House, and they, they were the ones who introduced me to Tanya Leon. Tanya Leon formed at, with the Brooklyn Philharmonic, she formed a chamber ensemble, which performed community concerts around uh, Brooklyn. And she asked me to, to show her some of my chamber compositions. And so, that's how I got my first New York City professional performances through Tanya Leon and the Brooklyn, first I think it was called the Brooklyn Philharmonia and then it became the Brooklyn Philharmonic Chamber Ensemble. So um, let's see, I remember also Tanya saying to me, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but she said to me, I would never marry a musician after I married one, after I married Wilson Borman. <laughs> but uh, she said, life is too financially insecure. <laughs> and it was <laughs> financially insecure, but at any rate, it was a happy marriage. Um, he, he, he fortunately liked my compositions. Maybe that's why I married him. <laughs> Uh, but uh, to move on, um, I guess um, I guess the, the next important thing that happened in my career was around 1989, I 
entered a, actually it was a competition for African-American symphonic composers run by the Detroit Symphony. Although it was not called a competition, it was called a forum, but it was really a competition. And I was selected um, to have one of my, well, actually it turned out to be my um, thesis from Sarah Lawrence College, the 12 minute orchestral work I'd written. It was only orchestral work I'd, I'd written at that point. Um, so the, I, my composition was selected to be read by the Detroit Symphony. There was a winner selected, a male, of course, who, um, whose, whose work was performed in its entirety on a Detroit Symphony concert. I, though, did get one movement from, from my 12-minute orchestral work played at a children's concert. And I was happy about that. Um, and then um, I guess next, oh, also during this time, I guess in 1990, 91, 92, I, I got my first commissions for which I was actually paid money to write compositions. One was from Cygnus Ensemble, William Anderson, the guitarist, commissioned me to write a piece for flute, guitar, and drum set. And then um, a second one was, was from um, a choral group in Minneapolis, um, Minnesota, the Plymouth Chorus and Orchestra. And so I wrote, I think it was a four minute work for chorus and orchestra that was performed in, I think that was 1991 in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, nets of importance, I guess, was, um, around, oh, is my time up? I heard a noise. Okay, <laughs> well, that's uh, I didn't make the noise, but I think that we are running terribly late, so. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, you mentioned that I, I won um, an international uh, competition for uh, composers, um, the, the Vienna Master, Master, what was it called? Um, the, the Vienna Masterworks, I guess, competition which was run by the husband of uh, Nancy Vandervate. And so that was actually my first trip to Europe. The, um, com the company paid for my work to be recorded and performed by the Moravian Philharmonic. So um, just to bring things to a close, I began working full-time at Borough Manhattan Community College in 2003. I worked there for 15 years and I taught an introduction to computer music class there. And I, I should also mention that uh, in 1998 to 2000, I did study computer music at uh, Brooklyn College. Okay, so I'll end with that. Thank you very much, Joyce. Interesting <laughs> history. Um, can we move to Lori now? And uh, can you tell about her things? And then we'll move to the more Columbia Studios oriented question after Lori speaks. I can't hear you, Lori. Sorry, I had myself muted while the other people were speaking. Ah, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, there's so many things I want to say that I will try to like speed talk and get in as much as I can because we are running quite late. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if, if it goes on too long. Um, my background was um, I did I didn't have the whole classical music training during childhood, but my background was in folk instruments and folk playing and guitar, which led me to lute, which led me to lots and lots of study of, of, um, of early counterpoint and contrapuntal forms and things. I was always somewhat nerdy. Um, anyway, um, at the time I 
uh, I, I, I did some work at the Colonial Princeton Studio. I had been um, Jacob Druckmann's assistant, and he was um, working regularly up there on his um, pieces that often involve dialogues between electronics and a live player. Um, and at, just went dark, okay. Um, and at some point he invited me to come up and have lunch with him and Vladimir. And I'm not sure if Anna Gunning was also at that lunch, but um, it was like an amazing discussion. Vladimir, who grew up, was a, a kid in China, was like, we went to this Chinese restaurant and Vladimir was like, bring me the real menu, you know, the one in Chinese. He was fluent in Chinese. Anyway, um, whenever Jake didn't use his studio time there, he let me use it. So I started working um, at the Columbia Princeton studio doing recordings and composing and stuff. And I also did tape editing for Jake Druckmann and, um, you know, miscellaneous assistant like things like um, for reading parts and all that. But um, so, so um, I had previously worked with Morton Sabotnik's Bukla, uh, which I first met in his studio over the Bleecker Street studio. Um, so I went to the Bukla, I mean, as an improviser, as a guitar and banjo player, um, from the 60s, I kind of um, naturally loved working directly with the sound and writing notes on paper, dealing with symbols for sounds was just not as satisfying. Um, so, um, you know, I, work, I love to work like a painter on the actual sounds um, on the work itself. Anyway, so um, I started doing work up there. Um, using mostly the book um, did my audio drop out or just my image anyway um, I, I want to give some context um, the um, the musical geography of New York City at the time that I worked there in the early 1970s was that downtown music was to, to oversimplify highly experimental kind of anything goes um, and there was a movement to restore or um, some of the musical basics that the post Webernight serial composers were considered prohibited um, like motor rhythm um, tonality modality um, consonants um, and the love of just sound for the sake of sound, you, know, you just get into a sound and and you work with the evolution of timbre within that sound. Um, because Uptown and Columbia Princeton, Columbia was kind of like an archetypal place of this, was um, heavily influenced by the post Night serialist trend, which um, although I studied it in detail at Juilliard, I never identified with it or liked it much. Then in between those two, there was this whole midtown area of music, which was um, commercial. And I, I had in the early 70s, a steady job doing soundtracks for a small production company. I did all of their soundtracks for several years. So that kind of paid my rent and tuition at Juilliard, which is they get you through the nose. Um, anyway, so I, I kind of was in all of, I was active in all of the different musical subcultures um, one way or another in, in terms of the gamut between tonal and modal and total outer space. Um, there was, there had been support for the Columbia Princeton Studio from the Rockefeller Foundation and the U.S. government. Um, in part, there was this Cold War thing going on with um, the socialist, the, the Soviet Union kind of forcing tonality on composers, to which the United States Information Agency responded by wanting to promote what they saw as the most ruggedly individualistic music. So there was funding and support for the post-Babernight serial blip and bleep school of electronic music, as I 
so I tended to call it. Uh, personally, I just I just wanted I got lost in the sounds. I loved the sounds and um, electronic music opened my ears to hearing in whole, whole new ways. And I, I was not really that aware of gender as a as a factor uh, back then, although it's receiving a great deal of attention currently. Uh, I was simply into the process. I got to know Vladimir pretty well um, after I got frustrated by the limitations of analog and started working with computers out at Bell Telephone Labs. I drove Vladimir out there a number of times because he was curious about the computers. He never got, I mean, computer programming was just going a step too far for him, but he was very interested. Um, and we also discussed archiving the history of this all a good bit. Um, anyway, that that's um, probably a good intro. Is that my five minutes? Yes, thank you. That's perfect. Um, yeah, so let's move to the second um, part, which is, and I know that all of, uh, most of you have already said something about the Columbia Studios, but maybe now you could uh, do any additional reflecting on this, your experiences at or with the studios, what your role was, who you were directed with. How did the CMC impact your work past and present? I'm not sure we've gotten into that. So it's going to have to be a shorter round unless we can run late. Um, I'll try to find out about that. So um, anyway, maybe two or three minutes. Is that doable? And um, any order? Who would like to go? Who would like to start? Joyce, are you speaking? I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. I'll start since I didn't say much about the electronic music studio at Columbia. Like I, I think I did say that um, I submitted, I, I took to a meeting with Yusuchewski my orchestral composition from Sarah Lawrence and he admitted me to his class. And then um, he assigned me to, to um, Alice Shills as, as my studio instructor, I suppose I, I should say. Um, and I studied with both Yusuchewski and David Dosky. But um, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm actually a little surprised that I, I was asked to be on a, a panel uh, because for this, um, because uh, I never really considered e electronic composition my main emphasis, but it was something I enjoyed doing. So I took classes, <laughs> I'll put it like that. And uh, so after I graduated from Columbia, I really did not do any electronic composition, but in 1998, I decided to take a computer music class at Brooklyn College. And there I studied MIDI composition with Noah Krzyzewski and Pro Tools with George Bruno. And lo and behold, one day I, I looked on the door and we had a schedule on the, the lab door and I saw the name Alice Shields. And I said, well, I should knock on the door and reintroduce myself. So sure enough, that's what I did. Also, I had run into Prill Smiley, I should mention over the years, uh, Meyer Kufferman always gave a yearly, well, I shouldn't say always gave, but for years he gave a yearly Carnegie Hall concert. And um, so Prill Smiley would sometimes show up at, at those Meyer Kufferman concerts, but um, I, I studied with Meyer Kufferman uh, off and on for a while. Um, and uh, so at any rate, I, I studied um, a, a year and a half computer music at Brooklyn College. And then, as I said, I, I was uh, employed at uh, Borough Manhattan Community College and I was asked if I could teach a com computer music class. So I taught an introduction to computer music class I taught uh, Sibelius notation software and I taught uh, Pro Tools. So uh, at any rate, that, that tells you a little bit about my electronic music composition. Great, thank you. Um, and um, yes, maybe we'll just uh, move to perhaps Judy, would you like to 
continue with your uh, reflections on the Columbia Studios? Sure, um, I'll, I'll, I'll make it short. Um, so we I, may be able to go longer, it's looking like, so I'll fill you in. <laughs> okay. Um, I was never officially affiliated with the studios at, at uh, Columbia, or with the studios in Prentice. Um, But my reflections, will they date from 1987, um, probably in, until about a decade ago. So I have, I've, I've sort of retreated. Um, so I actually had to contact Brad and ask him for a timeline because I'm like, you know, this was 35 years ago and you're asking for reflections on the, on the studio, but I've got some. Um, there were and, and can I say also that to everyone that, I mean, this can be about impact that you feel today, even, you know, um, it doesn't have to be only about 35 years ago. So, yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, words came to mind when I started to think of the, of, of the studios there. Um, and I guess I should say that at the time, this, the studio was, was in transition between um, the, being the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center and the Columbia Computer Music Center. That, so it, there, were, there was a time of, of transition. But the words that came to mind for me were openness, welcoming, family, core with satellites, experimentation, expansion. Um, and I'll add to that after uh, hearing Alice speak earlier today, diversity of style. Um, so, yeah, uh, br as briefly as I can, uh, Brad, Brad came to, came to that center um, in 1987, and he worked closely with Curtis Bond, who was at the center where I was in Brooklyn College. Um, because both had uh, Sun computers with you know, problems with, with um, the um, audio uh, interface, et cetera. Brad was riding a driver, I think, going absolutely nuts. So those two, those two became very, very close. And it wasn't long after that that Brad actually became, um, along with maybe Paul Lansky, the go-to person anytime there was any kind of technical problem, call Brad. We didn't want to disturb Paul, it was called Brad. Okay, so at that time, the um, name of the Sun, the Sun computer that he, that he was running was Woof. And he, uh, Brad <laughs> made um, Wolf meetings or Wolf get togethers. And they were open to everybody. I mean, I wasn't there, I wasn't at, at, at Columbia, but I could come part participate as could every, everybody else who wanted to. And we shared music, shared um, projects, um, trials and tribulations, et cetera. So it was a time when there were, or it was, there were not a lot of people to begin with in the field of computer music. Um, and there certainly were not a lot of women. Um, actually, uh, Lori Spiegel in at the ICMC in 1989 at Columbus, Ohio. I remember her words. My gosh, there are five women here. Because prior to that, she had been the only one. <laughs> so there were there were a few of us. We were we were growing. I mean, and, and it was included. I don't, I don't know, Mara, if you were there at that particular ICMC. Which one? We, in Columbus, Ohio. Yes, I was. That was my first. Well, okay, you were one. Of, you know, one of the five. I think it actually might have been been seven. Frances White was there, who was you know my colleague out at, at Brooklyn, et, et cetera. So, the studio, which was not yet the CMC, 
but it was extremely welcoming. Uh, we could just, we, we could go there. And, and when there were guest lecturers or demonstrations, people who were not a part, uh, you know, officially affiliated, neither, neither student nor professor or staff, we were invited to, to go there and we did. Um, I wanted to say that there was something about a feeling of family because it was it had to do with the smallness of the of the the number of people who were in the field. We were all fairly insane to be working on computers at that at that time. And I mean, I remember going out to to Brooklyn to write a program to generate one sound, going back the next day to find the error that I had and starting all over again. I mean, so that so there weren't many people willing to go to go through that. Um, sometime after the CNC was created, so after, I think, 1996, I actually had some troubles in my workplace at home. And um, so I became uh, uh, invited by Brad, I became an unofficial guest composer. And I just kind of held on to that for clout for years and years and years and years and years. So I was up there a lot. And that was when I witnessed this tremendous openness to style that I think um, Alice really so well defined about the studio as it had been. And in terms of family, it was like, you know, we all have blood families, core and extended. We have neighbor families. We may have social political families. Wolf and CMC became like the core of a professional family. Um, so those with actual positions, faculty, staff, or, 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 or students formed the core, but the rest of us were extended. And I felt it as kind of, I mean, it's a vague impression, but a kind of orb with satellites, I mean, geographical satellites that extended far beyond. So different centers throughout the United States, primarily in the United States, also were kind of like satellites of the Columbia, the Columbia Studios. That's pretty much what I should say, and I should stop talking. Thank you for that wonderful perspective. Yes. So um, either Norma or Lori, would you like to go next about your reflections on the studios? Lori, you're speaking and I can't hear you. Sorry, I had muted myself again. Uh, I wanted to quickly follow up on something Judy said, which is that um, in the early days when there were not many people doing electronic or computer music, and we were really regarded widely as a kind of lunatic fringe who were dehumanizing music by introducing technology, um, a lot of us worked in shared studios in, in a way that's very different from how young people often work now at home alone in their bedroom with their laptop and that there's a big cultural loss in the fact that everybody has their own studio now uh, in their own little computer um, because the shared studio was always a, a community sort of almost like a family and I, I was lucky to belong to several at different points and so I, I resonated with, with with thinking about that when when Judy said what she did the end of comment. Um, Great, thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to get back to Norma too again about uh, any additional thoughts about the Columbia Studios. Well, I don't, I was only there for the one occasion. Okay. And uh, my memories, of course, were working with Mario Davidovsky, who I had met actually in Tanglewood in 1958. So we were actually friendly and uh, he, um, I could not have done my work there without some help because I was not technically involved or technically clever, or even though I knew how to work at Splice Tape, et cetera, for my work at CBC. But um, Mario was very, very conversant with all the equipment there. And it was extremely important to me because I was a 
I was only able to spare the time for six weeks to do this gigantic piece for uh, narrator, solo soprano, choir, and orchestra, and tape. So it was, uh, it was really a, a battle. I'd go up to the Columbia, uh, and then I'd tear home with my pieces of tape and uh, at the rented apartment that I was living in at the time for the six weeks. And then the next day I'd be back there again for another couple of hours and it was back and forth, et cetera. It, ref it was a wonderful uh, experience for me. And I, I have Ushachevsky to thank because he knew of my um, reputation in, in Canada because they had been consultants with the um, University of Toronto Electronic Music Studio. And they and so he knew who I, I was in terms of... Uh, composition so it was very uh it was a great experience for me and uh I unfortunately I didn't need to go back there again because the Toronto studio then was working for for me and being in a, a a studio that was using equipment from the CBC <laughs> CBC had donated a couple of tape recorders to the uh Toronto studio. So that permitted me as a foreigner, not a student to go there and work. <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was fun. And I'm terribly sorry that the picture, I've not been able to figure out why the picture has not come up. But anyway, my old face is probably not going to be missed. So anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to this and Judy and Laurie and Joyce and Mara. I enjoyed hearing you. Yes, thank you all. Um... And I think we can take, um, you know, and if anyone has any additional perspective before we go to the audio question, audience questions, I think we could hear from you. If you had any final thoughts while anyone else was speaking, feel free to chime in now. I, I do have a question for other people who have worked, who worked in the Columbia Princess Studio in the early days. To me, um, when I would record something there and then play it elsewhere or bring it home, it never sounded quite the same. And I realized there there seemed to be a resonance um, or a background sound to that room where where the where we, we did music up at 125th Street that gave a coloration to everything that was done there. And I wondered if anyone else had perceived anything like that who, who did work there. Mm. I have to say that Alice addressed this earlier today, precisely what you're talking about. So, I, I thought it, it should be recorded as a presence, maybe, and overdubbed onto all of the music that was recorded there that went straight to tape without the re room residence so that the music would be audible in the way it sounded to the people who were making it while they were making it. Mm. Interesting. That's Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Can I expand just a moment on, yes. the, on the openness of the of, of the CMC? Because, yeah, wonderful. Because this does go into you know the present and 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 the future. Um, when I think back, I actually um, might be able to identify pieces that were composed um, using C sound, and at the um, Brooklyn College Center for Computer Music, Center for Computer Music at the time that Charles Dodge was director. I don't think I could ever identify a piece that has been composed at um, the Columbia Studios because of this absolute openness to diversity of style. And something, there's also something about an extreme um, welcoming of individuality. One of the most striking, I'm just gonna say the word things to me, um, it was Brad's dislike of concert settings and his bringing computer music into people's living rooms in different ways and I, it makes me th it makes me think of the uh, my music book for example which is completely different from at that time from any other computer music and 
everybody who was at that center, I mean, Mara, my goodness, um, in what, what 80, 89 wrote um, Stoke Grand, I mean, the stochastic uh, granular synthesis program. Um, you know, this was just, it was like, there was such an encouragement there to um, just expand, do what you need to do, explore, expand, go outside of the boundaries. And uh, I'm sure that continues today. Uh, may have to do something with the establishment of the um, uh, Department of Sound Art. I'm not sure, but there is, but very special, I think, to the CMC, not found in other centers. Yeah, that correlates with my experience too. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I, I do see a question in the chat. Yes. Oh, I think we're going to get to the chat questions. Would you like to answer the one with which one are you referring well, to? Well, the one about uh, how was electronic music taught? Well, I was there, you know, like this was uh, 78, 79. And uh, of course, there weren't they weren't using uh, computers. We were, well, they did have the RCA computer there, of course, but um, we we were mainly using the Buchla synthesizer. So I mainly composed using the Buchla synthesizer and of course the tape recorders, right? Uh, splicing tape, etc. I remember my last composition there was called Apocalypse and it was inspired by the movie starring Marlon Brando. <laughs> And uh, it was a quadraphonic composition. Great. And this question, maybe we could make available to everybody, um, is which was, I guess, the one by Lawrence De Martin. Is this the one you're talking about? I'm not getting any audio. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. I can hear you too. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thanks for addressing that one question. We have a question. Joyce, is there any way to hear your work on the Buchla? Do you have tapes? Uh, I, th I hate to say it, but uh, I, I do have the tapes, but I, I have not even tried to play them for a while. I, I know I, I do have them in my apartment in Brooklyn, uh, which I still have, but um, I, I'm rather afraid that the tape has probably deteriorated over the years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure what kind of sounds. <laughs> I think you have to bake them and it's very tricky. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to go backwards through the questions. <laughs> I would say, though, that I do have some uh, computer compositions that I did at uh, Brooklyn College and after Brooklyn College. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> Great. Okay, here's a question from Lainey Pfefferman about, have you, any of you seen or been engaged with the kind of community you felt in sharing the studio growing existing in cyberspace? maybe even just recently to deal with pandemic times. Could you repeat it? Repeat yes. It. Um, have any of you seen or been engaged with the kind of community you felt in sharing the studio growing, existing in cyberspace? So I guess the kind of community you felt it in the studios, are you seeing this happening online, even just recently to deal with pandemic times? I think that's always going to be strongest at the very beginning of a new technology when there are very few people doing it and the resources are scarce and people have to work together sharing equipment. The early days of the internet when we were doing internet relay chat and um, gopher and stuff like that, it was like that too. Um, then when the web opened it up to everybody that that intimacy was lost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? That's an interesting question. 
Okay, um, here's one from Norma. Um, Pat McMaster is a student at Concordia University in Montreal. Thank you for the panel. My question is for Norma. You've composed work for such a broad range of commissions, theater, ballet, puppet shows, television, radio. How much was your compositional process influenced by the medium of presentation? So maybe this is an interesting question. How much is a compositional process influenced by the medium or genre? How much is the compositional process influenced the by the medium? I guess he's talking about the genre of theater, ballet, puppet shows, television, etc. Well, I only did the one ballet actually, but I went and actually attended a um, what was national choreographic seminar out in Banff uh, in order to understand how the dancers' problems were you know, what kind of problems they had, what the choreographic, we had to do a ballet every every day. Yes. Uh, we were assigned dancers and we were assigned a, um, a choreographer and a, a composer and everybody had to present a, a ballet in the evening in the same day. So we were really worked very hard in five weeks to understand how, how to work with dancers, et cetera, and then the problems. Anyway, um, it, that was an interesting experience. I was the only uh, real work I did with dancers. There was another possibility, but it didn't sort of pan out particularly. Um, my work was primarily with, with instruments and, and, and tape. Um, I always uh, was fascinated by using tape as an extension of the instrumental sound. And, and that was my main thrust. Mm -hmm. um, working with whether it would be orchestra or instruments. Uh, so the, the whole theatrical side of things was simply a, 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 a one on, a, a, no, an occasion from time to time. But basically it was um, working with instruments and, and we had some wonderful players in, in Canada, some wonderful um, uh, a viola player uh, and uh, you know an accordion player and they were all very keen on doing things with with tape in those days so I was very busy <laughs> and I'm very happy to be very busy too so great um another question from David Jagers asking you to speak about your radio commissions oh well David Jaeger um uh He's, he's asking what kind of question? About your radio commissions. Oh, well, yes, because David Yeager was a producer at CBC, as was I at one point of time. So we were very, um, very good friends, actually. Uh, he actually commissioned me to, um, oh dear, I'm trying to remember what PC he did. But anyway, uh, he, he was the one who introduced me to, um, to actually working with the computer music. He wrote a computer music program called Outperform. And uh, I did uh, a, an experiment with that and produced a wonderful glissando. And I thought that was the beginning of a piece for, uh, what I call a piece for Bob, what was written for Bob Aiken with, with tape using this opening glissando made out, uh, out of punch cards way back then. <laughs> yeah, that was painstaking. That was long before. Uh, but anyway, um, a piece David is referring to, oh my goodness gracious, wouldn't you know he would ask that question. Uh, I did, CBC did commission me quite free, quite frequently. The piece for Bob was a commission in 1975. It was Bob being Bob Aiken, who was a a ph phenomenal and is a phenomenal flute player. And he was my colleague in the founding of new music concerts back in the 1970s, which still goes on to this day, et cetera, et cetera. So, so. Mm -hmm. uh, does that answer the question? I'm not sure. Mara, you muted. Sorry, I'm muted. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, Lori Hollander asks, uh, Lori, is that an original Macintosh behind Lori Spiegel? Do you use it? 
I can't hear you, I'm sorry. You're muted. How do I unmute Lori? Lori, unmute. Please unmute Lori. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a Mac SE. So it's not the really early ones. My first Mac was a Mac 512, but <laughs> this is not SE, which was later and actually had the option of having disk drive, which changed everything. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. And it's. Mara, oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. Mara, there's, I, there's a question in the chat thing. There's a question to me from Bob Gluck. Okay, good. I'm sorry. I'm I'm probably missing some. I can't see that one. Where is it? What is it? It says, it says Judy. I'm curious about how your interest in non-human species intersected with any of the institutional elect uh, electroacoustic music worlds and institutions. And I I would like to say about that that I think that the field of electroacoustic music lends itself to documentary and to the addressing of world issues, one. And two, Bob, I owe you an email. Your voice is the basis of a piece that I have not released yet, but <laughs> it's, it's there. And I will write you soon. That's it. Awesome, thank you. I just noticed all these questions in the, um in the chat from the panelists. And yes, the symposium is being recorded and available on the Heyman Center and Unsung Stories West websites for those who are asking. Um, right, okay. I think those might be all of our questions unless I could easily have missed something. If you see it and I didn't, please chime in. Oh, there was one great one from Elizabeth Hinkle Turner. Um, if the panelists might want to comment on this as appropriate, I would reflect that even though I have never been to the CPEMC, it has a strong influence on my work as a composer and musicologist. The women who came out of there, especially those featured today, stood as inspirational examples to those of us wondering whether we, as women, even fit in to this field, and in my place, were the first women composers who made themselves readily available to me and my questions and needs especially Dor Daria, Lori, and Judy. So even though for those who were not there, we can reflect on it. Thank you. So if that's um, very much appreciate the comment from Elizabeth and does anyone want to, uh, to respond to that? Lori, are you? Thanks. I would like to respond by thanking Elizabeth for all the work that she's done to record the history of us in this field. Yes, uh, for sure. Important work done over such a long time. It's great work. Yes, it is. Um, Alice Shields, it looks like you have a hand up. Is this right? No need. It was for a previous uh, conversation. It's time is Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay well i think we might be done then thank you so much everyone i really appreciated all of your comments and um the panelists wonderful descriptions and i think that we could easily go on for many hours with this topics and i hope that i get to talk to you all more and actually judy and i were talking about at one point um some kind of research project to document the stories of people in the field and we would love to see something happen to make that happen because there's a lot of really good information here that would be nice if it was saved thank you, yeah. thank you. yes I'd like to thank everyone who spoke today. So thank you for this fine panel. It was just um, really important to have you speak and I learned so much. Um, I'd also like to close this remarkable day for thanking everyone who participated. We had uh, 537 people register. So you can see there's tremendous interest in your stories, your histories, um, your ideas, your music and memories. Um, I just wanted to end with a few notes so then we can go home and 
have dinner. So one is I'd like to thank the live captioner who's been working very hard. You can see there's the CC live transcript tab, which I've been using uh, myself. So thank you. Um, I don't know your name, but uh, from the National Captioning Institute because it adds to our accessibility and we're really grateful you were here. Um, second, it is Norma B. Croft's birthday in two days, April 11th. So I wanted to wish her a happy birthday and to invite some of the many composers on this call to compose a birthday greeting. <laughs> Maybe by tomorrow, <laughs> it's your assignment. Um, and I also wanted to share the very happy news that uh, four unsung story speakers were announced yesterday to be winners of the Guggenheim Fellowship. So I'm going to put that um, information, the link here. But one person is Zasha DeCastri, our intrepid co-director. So um, I just wanted to say before mentioning the other people's names, uh, we had two grants due the same day. One was the Guggenheim Foundation, the other was the Provost's um, application for anti-racist work. So we were both up till 11.59 p.m. madly finishing <laughs> these applications and we got both of them. So there was some um, magic dust in the air. Um, the other winners, in addition to Zasha, are Sky Mackley, who will be speaking tomorrow, Mia Masaoka, who is director of the sound art program here at Columbia, and a faculty member, and Nina C. Young. Um, so Sky and Nina are both alumni of the Columbia PhD program. So we're very proud of you, really happy about this news, and I think it shows just the strength of Columbia training in composition. So congratulations to you all. It's really thrilling. And Prill, of course, as um, Sasha mentioned, was also a Guggenheim winner. Um, and then just the last few bits, the, there is a tab um, on our site for listening to work by current CMC women and non-binary composers and sound artists. So we're trying to really make it a living archive and you can go to it when you have time and listen and learn about the um, next generation of composers, sound artists, because there's some really remarkable work and we want it to be both about the past and the future of um, electronic music, computer music composition. And the very last thing I'll say is we have another exciting day tomorrow, three round tables and a panel with 26 speakers. The themes are Women at the Computer Music Center, 1990 to 2014, New Histories and Futures for the CMC and Beyond, um, Fighting Systemic Barriers in Electronic Music. We have a fabulous panel of five people and um, I'll be moderating a session on a workshop that I founded in 2018 called For the Daughters of Harlem Working in Sound. So we'll have some of the workshop leaders. It's basically a program to bring young women of color to, from public schools in New York to the CMC and have them work with the equipment. So we have a video and reflections on that tomorrow. So we hope to see you all tomorrow. If you cannot attend, we are recording and we will make the archive available. It may take um, a few weeks just to pull everything together nicely. So thank you all. Enjoy your dinner and see you tomorrow. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs>